Hi everyone. Anybody out there can tell me if you can hear me and see me. Let me know. All right, good deal. Thanks, Nikki. All right, so um, my name's Judy Luther, and I'm going to talk to you today about canine cognition and how we can use canine cognition to teach the animals that we work with. So I'm going to read this description or this definition of canine cognition because I don't want to mess it up for you. I want to make sure that you get this correctly or get the right information. Dog intelligence or dog cognition is the process in dogs of acquiring information and conceptual skills, storing them in their memory, retrieving, combining, and comparing them, and using them in new situations. Dogs demonstrating the theory of mind by engaging in deception. So one of the things that was really interesting in the research, the behavioral scientist uncovered a very surprising set of social cognitive abilities in the domestic dog. Abilities that are neither possessed by dogs closest canine relatives, such as wolves or coyotes, nor by any other intelligent mammals, such as great apes. And the interesting thing that they found was that dogs were more like toddlers, actually human children, if you want to put it that way, than they are like some of their relatives. So if we take this information and we use this to our benefit when teaching our dogs, we can come out with some phenomenal results. One of the things that I tell all of my clients is to treat your dog like you would your toddler. Now, I don't mean put bows in their hair and take them around in a little stroller, but I do mean look at their emotions, how they function, how they learn, and their cognitive abilities because it is much like a human child or a toddler. A couple things um, relating to the cognition is their perception. So dogs have a mental process where they absorb incoming sensory information and they retain this information that, that they absorb. They also have an episodic memory. They can recall past events that include some pretty complex actions of the humans and they're able to replicate those. They also have object permanence. Now this is the ability of an animal to understand that objects continue to exist even when they've moved outside of their field of view. A while back, people were playing that game where they would hold up a sheet on one side of the door, they'd drop the sheet, move to the side real quick, and disappear out of the dog's vision. That was troublesome for dogs, and the reason it was so troublesome is because they have object permanence. They didn't understand what was going on. Dogs are also capable of learning words. Various studies have shown that dogs really learn the names of objects and they can retrieve an item from among many others that are given by, or by just giving its name. So in 2008, I think was the first case where that was really obvious to people. And it was Betsy, a border collie, and she knew about 340 words by the retrieval test. And this was also, or she was also able to connect an object with a photographic image of the object, despite having seen neither before. And I'm going to tell you a little personal experience with that. I had a client um, many years ago and she was a kindergarten teacher and she was bringing her puppy into a world where she had never met the grandchildren in the family. So what she did and I worked with her on this, she put pictures of her grandchildren on the wall. Every day she would walk up, she would point to the pictures, show her little puppy, this is Alice, or this is Jim, or this, this little person right here is Billy. It was so fun because when Christmas came around, she was able to have her puppy hold something, a little gift bag, and say, take it to Billy, take it to Alice, and the puppy was able to do it. She was a kindergarten teacher, so she had a, a lot of experience with this. 
but it's pretty amazing that this dog was so capable of doing this. We've also seen some unbelievable incidents of dogs understanding and learning words and names of objects. If you think of Chaser the Border Collie once again and Rico the Border Collie. So we talk a lot about Border Collies in these studies, but any dog can do this. And um, I do this every day with various breeds of dogs. So it's not something delegated specifically to Border Collies. Dogs are also capable of of social learning. This is my most enjoyable thing, way, I should say, to teach dogs. So what we will often do is demonstrate something and then ask the dog to replicate the behavior that we just demonstrated. That is social learning. And if you think about it, we are social learners as well. Actually, pretty much every living being out there is a social learner. We watch other people and we mimic or we replicate their behaviors. If we see them doing a behavior that they have a bad outcome as a result of doing that behavior, then we look at that and we choose not to follow their lead. Dogs will do the same exact thing. So if you see your dog um, watching another dog and that other dog gets hurt doing something or the other dog has a great time doing that thing that'll give your dog the decision ability to make a decision is that a safe activity or is that a dangerous activity so it's wonderful when we can utilize that this is another reason why I always tell my clients if you have a senior dog or an adult dog that's a great family pet you know what bring in your puppy because that adult dog is going to be a great teacher and help you make your life a little bit easier with that puppy he's actually going to do a lot of the training for you the adult dog will also um, fast mapping is part of the cognitive process this is the ability to farm a quick and rough hypothesis about the meaning of a new word after only a single exposure. So we do this as well. And I mentioned Rico, the Border Collie, and he was able to fast map. And he would initially view labels of over 200 items, and then he could interfere the names of novel objects by exclusion. I do this when I teach dogs colors. Recently, we had a rescue dog and we were teaching her, I believe we were teaching her yellow and red and the new color for her was blue. I might be wrong on those colors, but when we held up the color she wasn't aware of or the color that she didn't know, she was able to determine that that wasn't the correct color. So for instance, if we held up yellow and red and she liked yellow and red, blue was a new color, we would hold up blue and red and ask her where blue was and she would point to blue knowing that it wasn't red. Hope that makes sense. It's just a lot of fun to do that type of thing with the dogs and just kind of learn. So the theory of mind with dogs is the ability to attribute mental states, beliefs, intents, desires, um, pretending, knowledge, etc., et things like that, to oneself and to others. And to understand that others have beliefs, desires, intentions, and perspectives that are different than one's own. So dogs are capable of theory of mind. There are also other things that dogs are capable of that a lot of people never really paid attention to, and that's overnight learning. So this requires the ability to manipulate abstract images, which is thinking. A lot of times I will work with a dog, maybe with a little harder task than what would be normal, and the next day that dog remembers and the dog will be able to perform the task even better than when he initially learned it. So it's almost like practicing in your mind overnight. So there's a lot of cognitive exercises that we want to think of. And um, some of the cognitive exercises that I teach dogs are mimicking. I like to teach them to identify colors and shapes. I like to teach them to answer yes and no questions. Boy, that is a huge help when you have potty training issues with dogs. And um, I, I really like teaching them the names of objects and the names of 
people in the family. So I think all dogs should know people, places, and things. And I had an interesting situation. I talk to my dogs all the time. And I talk in full sentences, and I know a lot of people don't believe that that is something that works for dogs, but boy, it really does. And um, they know downstairs, dad works downstairs in his office. Well, we had tornado sirens coming off one time. And I looked at my girls and I said, girls, it's a tornado. We have to go downstairs to daddy's office. And they both ran downstairs to dad's office. They didn't know what a tornado was, but they did know go downstairs to dad's office. So I was using a noun there, dad's office, and I was giving them a verb, go to. They're really, really capable of learning a lot more than we realize that they do. I also like to teach dogs to count. That's just fun. And we can have fun by teaching them to read words. I did something a few years ago, excuse me, when I was teaching a cognitive class and one of my students was kind of iffy about the dog that she had. And she would th say things to me like, this dog's a ninny, this dog's not real smart, this dog's dumb. That really bothered me. So I went home and I thought, what can I do? And, and to make things worse, this, is, this lady's a friend of mine. So what can I do to help this individual feel more connected to her dog? And she was pretty much giving up on everything. This was a um, golden retriever. So I went home and I found pictures of golden retrievers in various body positions, lying down, sitting, standing, and lifting a paw. I knew her dog knew all of these behaviors. So what I did is I sat her in a chair and I stood back with a video camera and I gave her these cards and I said, hold them up and show them to your dog. And let's see what happens. I, I had no idea what was gonna go what was gonna go on with this, but we gave it a shot. So she held up the sign that's or the picture rather of the golden retriever sitting. And her dog looked at it and sat. She held up the golden retriever standing and, and said, can you do this? And her dog stood. And she did the same thing with the lie down and the paw. So what that showed her was that her dog was not stupid, as she said. And her dog was really, really, really um, brave and smart and capable of learning. And um, it kind of opened my eyes. That dog then became a dog that she was super connected to and she no longer has that dog but they became a, a connection and a bond that I haven't seen in a long time with a lot of dogs. So that's kind of social learning but social learning through pictures and um, an interesting thing that happened I had another client there with the Bichon and this was probably one of the smartest dogs that I've worked with. Nope, not a border collie of Bashan. And um, he could not do that, that game. And so I haven't had the opportunity with the pandemic and everything stopping us from doing a lot of in-person things or any in-person activities. I haven't had the opportunity to try that same exercise using pictures of Bashan's. So maybe they struggle a little bit more mimicking the behavior of a dog in pictures that is not the same breed as theirs. I don't know, that's yet to be found, so that'll, that'll be kind of fun. So part of cognition, one of the things that, that we talk about in cognition is social learning. And social learning is that process where individuals learn to observe the behaviors of others, and then they evaluate, as we mentioned earlier, whether those behaviors are positive or negative. And um, then they, they decide whether or not they want to follow that. So social learning is basically the transfer of information from one individual to a more experienced individual. I like teaching dogs this way. And the reason I like teaching them this way is because it is super, super fast. And I'm gonna give you an example. If I were to teach a service dog to walk across the floor, across the room, pick up a medicine bottle or a cell phone or anything and come back to me, we have to think about all the steps that would take if we were going to shape it or if we were going to teach the individual uh, behaviors and then put them together. 
into a chain, that's going to take us a very, very long time. But if we have a dog that understands social learning, enjoys social learning, then we can go in and we can just observe them. And I'll often say to a dog, hey, watch what I'm doing, and I'll go and do something like pick up that phone, pick up that medicine bottle, pick up whatever it is, and bring it back to a location, and the dog will mimic my behavior. Now, initially, it may not be perfect. I'm not so sure it needs to be perfect, though. We're just trying to teach the dog to watch us, right? And we're trying to teach behavior quickly. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples, real life examples, where that is working. I have um, a social uh, a service dog organization in California that attended one of my seminars, and they sent me a beautiful video. And what they were teaching their dogs to do was to go and get help. So one of the girls acted as the dog, and she asked the dog to watch her, and she walked over to an individual which would be a stranger in the street, maybe in a real life situation. And she kind of tugged on the, the um, cuff of the person's jacket. And then the person followed the dog back to the initial, or followed the acting dog back to the initial person that needed the help. So then they said to the dog, hey, can you do what we just did? And the dog did. The dog went over to the person, looked at the person, touched their sleeve, didn't tag on it, and brought the person back. So that was a super, super quick way to teach a very long chain of events. And interestingly enough, that chain of events was something that that dog is really good at now and does quite frequently. It's part of that dog's job as a service dog. So we can speed up the learning process using social learning. Um, social learning also builds confidence because it's a whole lot of fun and things are very, very positive when you're doing social learning. So um, if you can do social learning with the dogs, you're just going to find dogs that are brainiacs. Um, I will tell you, dogs already social learn. They social learn. Uh, what's the thing that we hear the most about? My dogs put their feet on the counter, right? Well, their feet, their front feet, are our hands in their minds, right? So when they put their, their hands up on the counter, they're mimicking us. Now, sometimes they're looking for something up there, but it is something that they will mimic. So we have to realize when we're doing things, dogs may mimic it. Now, my Border Collie also will walk in and put her feet up on the counter. And in her case, she's looking for her snacks. And I'll just simply say to her, Hey, girly, that's bad manners for puppies. We don't put our feet on the counter, and she'll, she'll drop her feet down to the ground. So it's a conversation, right? And it's a learning opportunity, and it's a learning experience. So just talk to them. You'll be super, super surprised at um, how well they learn when we are just talking to them, just having a conversation. So um, that's something to try with your dogs. But social learning can be used to teach very specific skills. And we use these with working dogs, as I mentioned with the um, service dogs. We can also use this with dog sports. I um, started one of the first Frisbee dog clubs in the United States many, many years ago. I should say disc dog, there's some legalities there. And um, one of the things that we always did is we brought the new dogs in, and the new dogs were allowed to watch the, the dogs that were currently in the sport. I'll never forget one day, a very well-known trainer in my area and somebody I greatly respect walked up to me and said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Dogs don't learn from watching other dogs, but we know now that they do. <clears throat> so allow them to do that in dog sports. My um, youngest border collie now, she is not a dog that wants to do jumps and vaults. And I know later Ruby's going to talk a little bit more about dog sports and, and dog, uh, disc dog activities. But a lot of times dogs, uh, they don't understand that jumping off your back to catch a frisbee. So I took her to watch a friend of mine and she learned after that that jumping off your back is a safe thing. It is okay. So um, you can utilize that for dog sports. A lot of people do this as well 
when they're teaching things like, um, oh goodness, agility and um, <clears throat> herding. We always do this in herding. We let our the other dogs watch the dog that's learning, or the dog that's learning watch the more experienced dogs. Another place that you can use mimicking or social learning is to change unwanted behaviors. I had a Jack Russell that was absolutely horrible barker. No surprise there. Uh, we taught the little girl to, instead of barking, to whisper. And whisper is something everybody is kind of surprised about when I say that we can teach a dog to whisper. And so everybody asks how we do it. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you exactly how to do that right now. And you can see how many dogs you are. See if you can teach a dog to whisper. All you're going to do is you're going to sit fairly close to the dog where the dog can see your face and you're going to look at the dog and you're going to say whisper and then you're going to make a quiet wolf noise. So I'll say whisper, woof, like that. When the dog mimics me in any way, I don't care if it's a woof, a loud bark, whatever the first sound is that comes out of that dog's mouth is going to be my starting point. Okay, so I am going to, let's say we get a woof, I am going to ignore or not praise anything that is louder than that. So if I get a woof first time and then I get a woof, that's good. I'm going to, yay, I'm going to praise that. I'm going to verbally jump up and down. I'm going to be excited for that dog. And then I'm going to ask for something quieter and quieter and quieter. Now, that's the worst case scenario, but the best case scenario is the dog looks at you and immediately whispers. And um, I, I have found that to be so simple and so fun. I, I get a lot of dogs that they immediately whisper when they see me whisper. So um, you can use that, use that to your benefit. That's, that's a great way to utilize um, a great way to utilize social learning and mimicking. So social learning and mimicking is cognition. It is a form of cognition. So I'm going to back up a little bit and I want to talk about different ways that animals learn. And you know, it's the same way that we learn. So we learn in the same manner as dogs. So if you put yourself in the position of many of these things that we're talking about, it's much easier to understand. So dogs learn by association. And this is an emotional response. This is you touching the pan when you go to bring the cookies or the cake out of the oven and you burn and it burns. You're like, ooh, that hurts. You're going to remember next time, boy, that pan, don't try to reach in there without thinking about grabbing that pot holder or something. That's the association, right? And that's also a consequence. So they also learn by doing and seeing what the consequences of those particular actions are. They learn by observation. This is the social learning. This is what we've been talking about so far this morning. And um, this social learning, like I said, is so extremely powerful. So that's really the three ways of learning that you hear about. But um, I'm going to add one more, and that's they learn from experiences. So they learn what different environments, different experiences mean. My dogs learn that the experience of swimming is a whole lot of fun for them, or the experience of playing frisbee, or the experience of going to the park. So experiences are learning um, opportunities for you. But one thing I wanted to bring up when we talk about all of this, dog trainers often do a lot of training that is operant conditioning. Um, we do a lot of counter conditioning. We focus a lot on associations. We focus a lot on consequences. But I don't know that we spend enough time with social learning and observation and allowing the dogs to observe and teaching them through observation. If we do that, like I said, it's, it's just a fabulous experience. So your training will be shortened. You'll be able to acquire faster skills and more skills for your dogs. And um, I highly encourage it. It is just so much fun. And um, 
we always have a really, really, really good time with it. So social learning is something that I am going to suggest you guys go out and do. And um, I would love to see what some of you, the outcomes are. Um, and that, that's your, you know, the cognition we're talking about. One thing that I want to warn you of when it comes to social learning, as they can learn good things, they can also learn things that we may not like, we may not really want them to continue to do. So I learned many, 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 many years ago, when I'm gardening, pulling weeds, planting plants, leave the dog inside. Because the dogs like to mimic that digging, that um, pulling the plant out of the ground. So when I am out of my yard working, my girls go in the house and um, preferably not looking out the window at what I'm doing. But um, I hear this all the time from clients. My dog's digging in the garden and I'll ask them, were you out gardening with the dog? Yes. So um, it's, it's kind of funny when you hear that because it, it definitely makes a big difference. Um, when I am out on a walk, let's say I'm going through the woods and I come across a big tree across the, the path. What I will often do is I'll ask my dogs, hey, watch what I'm doing and can you do this? And I'll step over the, the tree or I'll go under sometimes depending on what it is. Um, it, it's always good to demonstrate to them what you are doing and then they will be able to follow that. And it, it just really helps with their confidence level and it helps them learn. The other thing that I will notice about social learning. I have a very good friend who has a child care for uh, children come into her home and she has some dogs and it's so hilarious because she will send me videos. Sometimes I get them weekly of the dogs out in the yard playing with the kids and maybe the kids are digging in the dirt and the dog will watch and then the dog starts digging and then the kids will watch the dog and then the kids start digging. It is hilarious. And I watched the other day where she said to the kids, hey you guys, pick up your toys, let's put them in the box so we can go inside, it's gonna start raining. And the kids would pick up the toys, put them in the box and the dogs were following along, picking up the toys, putting them in the box. So that was a lot of fun and uh, I love getting those videos. I get videos from people sometimes where they're teaching their little babies, uh, you know, the game where it's the stick and they put the various sizes of rings on top of the stick. Well, I have a lot of clients whose dogs are replicating that behavior and they're putting the, the ring on the stick after they watch the child do it. I'm sorry, I don't know the official name of that particular toy. Um, but this is just such um, enjoyable for the dog, an enjoyable way for the dogs to learn. Because you know what, I, I look at it like there's no right or wrong reason. If I do something in a specific order to the end result and the dog watches and the dogs don't do the exact things that I do, they might leave out a step, but the end result is always the same. So that's kind of a fun thing to do is to watch and see how your dogs are learning and how your dogs are observing um, you and your activities or the kids and their activities. I, I think it's kind of funny because the dogs really, really do like to mimic the children. And um, so if you have children, that that's when it's even more fun because I think they're even more connected to a child. I have a new neighbor and uh, their baby, I guess, boy, I guess he's two, turned two now. He'll come outside and he'll stomp his feet like this and my border collies will watch him and they'll do that little prance too. So you really never know what your dogs are observing, but it's nice just to see that they're mimicking. I also like to have people just sit back and watch because they will mimic other dogs as we mentioned and I find it very interesting when we go to the lake and I see one of my dogs jump up out of the lake and she'll be walking over to get her toy or to get a drink of water or something like that. She doesn't really drink the like water that much. She'll get out and she'll shake and then she'll walk over and get a drink and my, my younger dog will watch her. She'll get out of the water, shake, and then walk over and get a drink. So observing and watching what your dogs do is very eye-opening and very enlightening.
So I highly recommend trying out the social learning. Um, I also like to teach dogs colors. So colors is a very, very interesting topic, and I'll tell you why. For a long time, we all thought that dogs were colorblind. We know that they're not. We know they can see yellows, and we know that they can see blues. But I often experienced a situation where my dogs would pick pink toys out. So if I took them to the dog store and I said, pick out a toy, any toy, you can have whatever you want, they would always get a pink toy. They were always attracted to the pink toys. Why? I thought dogs couldn't see pink, right? So then um, a good 25 years ago, I'm playing frisbee with my dogs and my one dog, he wasn't real keen on the sport and I found out later he had some vision problems so he shouldn't have been real keen on it. But he always would go for a pink frisbee. So I thought, hmm, that's kind of odd that he likes pink frisbees and I would let them choose whatever frisbee they wanted when they would play. So I soon decided that before competitions I was going to do the same thing, unless they required me to use a certain frisbee. But um, my dogs all would start picking up the pink frisbees. And I noticed when they had the pink frisbees, they did a much better job. So I'm like, hmm, what's the deal with this vision thing? If they can't see pink, why are they always picking pink frisbees? So I, you know, I talked to vets about it and the vets are like, yeah, that's just a fluke. And I'm thinking it's too consistent to be a fluke, right? So what I did is I started researching even more and I came across a paper that talked about dogs understand and learn, or, or they can see rather, ultraviolet light. Well, guess what's on the ultraviolet scale? Pink. So that really opened my eyes. And at another time, I was lecturing to a group of, vet, of veterinarians, and one of them raised their hand and said to me, hey, I, um, I know that you're talking about color, but I, I wanna say something about that. And I was thinking, oh man, she's gonna tell me I'm totally wrong, right? And I'm, I'm okay with that, tell me what you know. And she said, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And she said, we're learning more and more about vision. And she said, there's actually another part of the eye that they have just discovered or have just found. And that part of the eye, we may think, or we may find out, has additional color in it or ability to see additional colors. So maybe, and I always say, why not give it a try? If you wanna see if they can see a specific color, that's great. I asked my dog the other day, of course I didn't have my video on. I asked her to go find her orange ball in a whole huge pile of toys with other balls in it too. And she nuzzled around, dug around and brought me her orange ball. So um, what do we have there? I don't know. I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answers to that. And I'd love to hear if you guys have had similar cases. Um, I do have videos where Clients will throw mini balls out in the yard and ask for a specific color. Bring me the red one, bring me the blue one, bring me the green one, and the dog brings that particular one back. They're all the same shape. They're all the same, of course, they're balls. They're all the same size. They're just different colors. Interestingly enough, I recently met a young lady who owns a livestock farm or livestock yard. Um, and she asked me to help her teach her dog the difference between the black cows, the white cows, and the red cows. So, you know, red in the cow world is more brown. So we're looking at trying to get the dog to bring in a certain cow. And we're working on it now, and she's doing a phenomenal job. We worked on um, those colors in the house. We're now, we worked on them then outside. We're now working on them with the cattle. So she's a herding dog. She's an Australian Shepherd, so we can put her out in the pen with the cattle and ask her to bring back a specific animal. And she's doing amazingly well at that. So I think that there are so many applications for teaching dogs colors right now. Um, the other thing I do, I like to teach them shapes. I just think it's fun. Why not? Um, anytime we can find something to do with them that's other than the you know strict boring obedience type stuff, I say go for it. Um, couple other things I will tell you, I don't teach be, uh, 
body position behaviors unless absolutely necessary. My border collie has to know a lie down for herding. And other than that, I really don't care what body positions the dogs are, are in. So for instance, if I need to stop at a curb or stop at a gate before going through, I will ask my dog to wait, but I don't care what that body position is. So I, I'm not a big fan of directing body position and I don't need to in the situation that I'm in. And I don't teach my clients that anymore because quite honestly, unless they need it, I just want them to let the dogs make those choices. So choice is a really, really, really big, big deal. I like to give the dogs as many choices as possible because when we do that, we see a reduction in stress and anxiety. If um, Also, I wanted to say, if you guys have questions, you can type them into the chat and um, I am happy to answer those because I wanted to leave some time for question and answers. Um, would love to know if you're doing this or have tried any of this. It's, um, it's so, so much fun. Um, like I said, I don't even do most of the things that traditional trainers do because I don't need to anymore um, with this process. Um, interestingly enough, when you teach dogs using the cognitive approach, you find that these dogs are problem solvers. They are not, um, not as needy. They can figure out the environment and what they should be doing in those environments. And uh, another great example of that is if you're sitting at the dinner table having dinner with the social learning aspect, with the cognitive aspect of learning, dogs will notice, oh, they're sitting there having dinner. I guess it's time for me to go relax. And my dogs know if I'm sitting relaxing, let's say I'm watching TV, they're going to be sitting and relaxing and watching TV. Not because I tell them to, but because they are feeding off of what I'm doing. They're mimicking, so to speak, my behavior. Um, I, I had my husband lock my border collie down in, in his office with him right now because generally when I do anything where I'm in front of a screen, my border collie will be sitting in a chair next to me. I think she thinks that she is going to a meeting too, but it's it's a lot of you know fun uh, mimicking kind of thing. And if I if I go to touch my computer, she reaches and tries to touch the computer. So you are going to see some mimicking in some cases, but with this particular application, you just say, "Hey, we're not doing that right now. This is mom's computer. Let me type this out." I don't want you misspelling anything or whatever. And uh, the dogs the dogs really do latch on to that. Um, yeah, like I said, any questions out there? Let's see, we have um, Jeff on here. And Jeff teaches a lot of service dogs and he is teaching using this method. So, um, and I know he's had some really good success. Let's see, Barbara. How to teach swimming or how to enjoy water activities. I'm not great at breaking down activities into small enough steps. Okay, this is the best question, Barbara, because when I, I had two dogs, um, one was a Border Collie, one was an Aussie. My Aussie was scared to death of water and I could never get him to do more than just wade his little paws in the water and that was a little much for him. So. When, when we lost him, I waited quite a while and I got my Border Collie, my, what I call my puppy now. She's now three. I wanted her to enjoy the water. We spent a lot of time at the lake and I didn't want her fearful like, like Rusty was. So what I did is I taught Annie to like water by, here's how I broke it down and this may help you, Barbara. I went to the water and I cupped my hand in the water and I tossed it up in the air and I went, wow, that's fun. And I would do that, you know, several times because, you know, you're tossing just a handful of water and it comes down and splashes. And I'd toss it and it would come down and splash. Well, it didn't take long before Annie would go to the water and she would paw at it, right? So she's not really capable of scooping it and splashing it like I was, but she figured out how to splash it hard enough that it would go up in the air. And then she decided it was a heck of a lot of fun to not only splash the water, but bite it. And she may have, if I think back 
hard enough. I, I can't remember whether or not she was biting the water sometimes when I would throw the water up in the air. But that whole act of just playing with the water, she didn't have to be in the water, that made her more and more interested in it. Her sister's a huge swimmer. Her, her My other border collie loves to swim. And so she would mimic her, but I, I like to just start by, you know, just making the water a fun toy. I hope that makes sense. And you can always call me Barbara and I can, you know, talk you through it too. But um, things like that are, are just so fun for the dog. Um, I also, when I'm doing mimicking things, uh, just another note, I don't, um, I, I don't really use treats very frequently. Uh, it's usually just verbal praise and excitement and having fun. I don't think the treats are always necessary in these cases. If you have a great relationship with your dog, you really don't have to pair these with treats. They enjoy you being excited just as much. And I guess I have to say with that, I don't not use treats. I still use treats quite frequently, but generally with my dog, since I have that relationship, since we play these games so much, they don't even need treats. And treats can sometimes in these cases slow the learning process because what they're doing, they're playing, 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 they're following, they're mimicking, they're copying things I do. And then they um, have to stop and eat that treat. It's almost a distraction in some cases where if I'm just praising them and making a big deal out of it, we can just go on to the next thing. I hope that makes sense. Um, love, no great, okay, no treat idea. Yeah, and I, I have a lot of clients that they don't want treats, period, the end. Okay, so um, I don't know how to say your name. Lolata, Lolat, sorry. Um, I'm going to show you how to name objects, and um, this is super quick, super easy, and um, I'm just going to look for a couple things that I can use. Okay, um, I try not to always use toys for this because I've learned from my Border Collie puppy that toys are so much fun that it's a big distraction. Yeah, and Barbara said that treats are a distracted, distraction. Um, for her so okay so your service dog struggling with retrieving things by name first we have to name the things so I'm looking on my table just for something to, to grab here so I'm going to show you bottle of water and um, glasses okay so what I'll do I'm gonna do this this is a straw all right because the glasses are hard to see I'll say this is a straw this is a bottle of water they might put their mouth on it. They might put it in their mouth. They might hold it for a second. That's okay. That's their way of learning about that item. So I'll say, this is a straw. This is a bottle of water. And then I'll repeat it a second time. This is a straw. This is a bottle of water. And then I'll say, which one's the water? And if they touch or look at the bottle, I'll say, yay, that's an awesome dog. Good job. That is a bottle of water. If they touch the straw, I say, oh, silly, don't you remember that's a straw? Here's the water. So I'm reinforcing the thing that I was asking for. Hope that makes sense. But I, I don't school them over and over. I literally say twice, this is a straw, this is the water. This is the straw, this is the water, and then I'll say which one's the water, okay? You don't need to school and school and school. Then, after that, since you're working with getting your service dog to retrieve things by name, then you can move to putting them on the floor and pointing to them. This is the water, this is the straw, remember? Which one is the bottle of water, or whatever the item is? So. I start with them in my hands. That just builds that close connection. And um, it, it helps us kind of focus with each other better. And then I'll move them to the floor. The other thing I'll do if I'm out walking my dogs, I try to name a lot of different things in the environment, okay? So ducks, ducks are a big thing. When we go on walks, we're always seeing ducks or geese. So I'll say to my girls, hey, look, there's the ducks. Now, 
if a duck was not a duck, if it was not something that was mobile, I may walk up to it and point to it and say, oh, it's a duck, look. And the more reinforcement of the name of an item in various locations is going to build that generalization of the name of the item. I hope that makes sense. So there's a lot of things that are named um, our car. You know, I'll say, hey, go get in the car. Where's the black car? Where's the gray car? Um, we just got rid of the gray SUV, so now we have the black car and the black car. I don't know what we're going to do about that um, with the dogs. But, uh, but they can learn objects like that as well. I, I hope that helps. And, and if it doesn't, feel free. You can message me, and, and I can help you work through any of those um, confusing aspects of it or anything that your dog is doing that may be a little unique that we can can work through. So don't hesitate to call me and I'll help you with teaching your service dog to retrieve my name. Um, Debbie asks, do you think they pair the word of the color with the item or the cow? Oh, in these cases. Well, we're trying to generalize it. So here's the thing that I do. When I teach shapes, I don't have any of this in front of me, when I teach shapes, what I do is I make sure if I'm teaching the shape of a triangle, that every shape I use is going to be yellow. So I'll have a yellow triangle, a yellow circle, a yellow square, so I make everything consistent. If I'm teaching colors, I will have a blue circle, a red circle, a yellow circle. So I don't want to build an association that all yellow triangles are actually yellow and they're not triangles. Does that make sense? So you want it to be as, um, oh, as general as possible, but as cons consistent at the same time. So if you're teaching shapes, make sure they're all the same color. doesn't matter what color. If you're teaching triangles, they should be all the same color. That's in the initial phases. Later, we can put three different colors of triangles up or six different colors of triangles and say find the red triangle, find the blue triangle, find the yellow triangle or whichever colors you're choosing. So initially just stick to one of those things and then you can can make it more interesting. So with this case with the cows, um, it's a little bit different and I was actually shocked that someone who basically is a um, hairdresser for a living is sitting there going, I'm going to teach my dog's colors. This was before she even met me. This is before I had even known her. And when I met her, I was like, that blows me away. I'm shocked. So um, with the cows, it's a little bit different because now we're taking it to yet another level. It's not triangles pasted on the wall. It's cows running around in the field. So that one's taking a little bit longer, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, I hope that answered your question, uh, Debbie. And then Jeff said, unfortunately, at least in his area, clients want body positions. I'm in an area with lots of shock jocks, blah, blah. Yeah, me too. Um, so I do teach, there are certain things that I do teach. I don't focus on sits and downs, like I said. I think it is imperative that we teach things like come when called, that we teach wait at doors and gates. Those are life-saving. I always teach emergency recalls, um, and yeah, sometimes dogs, or our owners rather, do ask for a sit-down stand, and when they do, I'll tell them, okay, remember, these are not that important, unless you have a specific need, like my Border Collie needing to do a lie down for her herding. I don't see them as important. I explain to them why they can actually be a negative in some cases. If they want to teach them, I'm not going to not teach those behaviors. I mean, if they want to teach your dog to sit, it's not going to cause any harm unless they're the person that's saying sit, 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 sit every three seconds at their dog. So if they really need that, I'll, I'll definitely teach it, but I don't let them spend a lot of focus on it. Um, speaking of sit specifically, I recent re recently read a study, an article, something that was talking about how we focus so much on things like body position with dogs that in a puppy class, 
they did some studies. They they followed some puppy classes, went to some puppy classes, did some some note taking, some tallying, and they found that in the average one hour puppy class, dogs are asked to sit or puppies are asked to sit 85 times. That's a lot of sitting. Um, I don't believe that's the request by the instructor. I believe that's the request by the owners. And I think owners use sit a lot to control because they, they want their puppy to stay still or they want their dog to stay still. And that's the only thing they really know. That's okay. But I think we need to be a little careful about that too, because um, there's a couple things that bother me about that. First of all, we ask that puppies not be walked on hard surfaces until they're 18 months old. We ask that we not over-exercise them until growth plates are closed, but we're asking for repetition in sits. So when I go to a client and they definitely, definitely want to um, have their dog sit down and stand, I tell them keep it at a minimum. And I, I don't want them to make that their big learning um, practice or their learning skill set. I want their learning skill set to be much broader something that's going to be more um, functional for the dog as far as using their mind. So we do a lot of um, enrichment with our dogs and honestly asking the dogs about colors or doing colors or going on walks and saying, I see something blue. Gosh, it sounds like we're talking to toddlers, but it's the same thing. Um, Lolata, I'm not saying your name right, I'm so sorry, but um, She's saying that she names things during walks. That's awesome. I love that. And, uh, you know, I up until probably pretty recently, I think people used to watch me on walks with my dogs because I'm talking to them, I'm engaging. And I think they probably looked at me like I was stupid too or I was crazy. But you know what? It's about the dog, right? We want them to have a broader experience and a, a broader um life and so this is something that really does help them expand their horizons. Um, I, I think that when we don't offer our dogs some of these things, learning the names of things, learning to identify colors, learning the names of places, I think what we often do is we kind of cheat them a little bit. Um, we're not giving them as much as we could. Um, I Unfortunately, I've had to learn how to spell much better and my husband has to learn to listen to me when I spell because we have to spell things like lake. Um, when we played Frisbee a lot, we had to spell Purina Farms because Purina Farms is where we practiced our Frisbee and where we did our competitions and that's close to our home. So we would have to spell it. After a while, the dogs knew when we were spelling where we were taking them and so when you communicate a lot and you teach them names of places and names of things, they really start learning that. So we often have to, you know, if I'm going out on a walk by myself without my dogs, because I, I walk, you know, quite far and I don't want to take them um, that far, I'll say, I'm going to go on a W. Well, they're starting to figure that out. So I might have to change it to stroll or something like that. But um, just remember, they're really, really capable of all these things. And they really do enjoy these things. They have a lot of fun learning various um, things like that. Um, another thing is that um, keep your session short. You saw what I did with here's a straw, here's a bottle, here's a straw, here's a bottle. They pick the bottle. Good. I might ask them one more time to pick something. I quit. When I teach anything, I do about two repetitions and I quit. I think we nag our dogs too much. I, um, I've done some work with some pretty high content wolf hybrids. Um, and I will tell you, if you ask them once, they may do it. Probably you're not going to get it a second time. Don't even bother. So I often look for just um, one or two reps of anything. My Australian Shepherd would be the same way. You'd ask him something, he'd do it once. You'd ask him for a second time, and I know what he was thinking. Okay, I'm just going to do it for you just because you probably weren't watching, you dumb human. And then um, if I ask him a third time, he'd look at me like, 
no way, I've already done this twice. You don't need me to do it again. So I think we do, I think we annoy them sometimes. So keep those sessions really short. They're gonna be able to learn better. And when they walk away from it, they will remember it with a little bit of a break. And I think this is true of many, many animals. I used to do that before I would compete with my horses. I would give them a big long break before the actual competition. So um, make sure you're not overdoing it with them. Keep it nice and short and sweet and um, to the point. Um, yeah, Lindy's the same way. She doesn't worry about body position. And I, I agree, stay and recall is huge. Stay, wait, and recall. Those are the things that are incredibly huge. I also teach an emergency recall because if there's an emergency, I want to say one word and that be it. And I want that dog to come to me. Okay, so Barbara asked, can you teach multiple things at once? In other words, should I teach focus on colors one week, shapes another week, and not mix the two, at least initially until they know them? Um, I don't plan that far actually what I do is I will maybe teach colors in the morning and then maybe in the afternoon I'll grab some shapes and do shapes and then maybe in the evening I'll do some items it's very very casual for me um, and in fact since I want my sessions to be so short I might be teaching something while I'm waking waiting for the coffee pot to um, to finish making my cup of coffee. So I'm gonna make it real short. I, I think that um, you might make them bored if you try to teach all things at one time. I mean, um, you know, take like a week to teach one specific thing. So I try to mix it up. I try to make it as, um, as flexible, as different um, each session. I sometimes go in different locations. Um, be careful because I don't want to always teach colors in the kitchen and always teach shapes in the living room because then they won't probably adjust as easily if I go to teach shapes in the kitchen. But I will say with this method, the dogs do tend to be able to generalize a lot quicker. They're going to generalize their behaviors without, um, without as many problems as normal. So I don't have to go teach something somewhere else just to get them to generalize it. Just keep things really flexible and always think I am teaching a toddler and that's why that kindergarten teacher that I worked with was so amazing with some of the ideas she was coming up with because she approached it just like this was a child. So if you think of your dog mentally, cognitively and their ability to learn as you would a toddler, that's all you need. Go for it. And I think you'll see some pretty, pretty amazing things. Um, yeah, casual, Barbara. Um, I'm not formal. I very rarely write things down. I'm not that person that's tracking much of the training that I'm doing with my own dogs. Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe I should be, but um, I just don't think about it. And that's probably why I don't have video cameras out like I should. But um, yeah, keep it casual. Keep it fun. Um, I have two minutes before my time's up. So if anybody else has a quick question, well, I teach in sit you. I'm not sure I know what that is, Lindy. I'm sorry. Let me know what that is. Um, I will tell you guys, too, that I do have an online course that has tons of videos and lots of lectures, um, short lectures. Like, I keep my lectures around eight minutes um, regarding this whole program, how to use cognition in teaching dogs and some of the people that have been on the comments here or that have been in the um, in the chat room here have taken my classes some have taken lectures that I have done live lectures since um, uh, yeah um, since we've got the pandemic going around I'm not lecturing anymore so I am doing an online course and I put a graphic on the Facebook page and any of you guys who have attended the virtual summit, summit will get 30% off. There's a code Ruby2021. We're gonna give Ruby all the credit here because she is the one that's you know, coordinated this. And um, if you go to the website, which is in the graphic as well, and 
you decide that you want to register for the trust center training class there'll be a question for the code just put the code in and it'll give you the the 30 percent off um, it's also a course that i add to from time to time and in addition to that i always want people to be interactive so if anybody has questions while taking the course I always want to go in there and make sure that they're getting everything they can out of it and you have lifetime access to it. Um, thinking about my dog as a toddler will probably help me with be more patient. You know what? That's the one thing that I have noticed when I talk to clients about that. They're like, wow, you telling me my dog's like a toddler made an entire difference in our world. It has help me be more patient, help me be more understanding, and help me be a better teacher. So yeah, that is definitely a very good point. Um, all right, guys, I have to um, log out here because I'm afraid I might be getting into somebody else's time. If you have questions, um, you can, I guess, put them under this post and I'll have access to it. Or uh, look me up on Facebook, friend me, and um, I'm happy to help. All righty. Hope you all have a great day.